over there at Bustown Solutions. I teach computer science at McAllister College, uh, and I also help organize this event a little bit. In particular, um, I wrote the software that generates the schedule. So, um, who's who's got beefs with the schedule <laughs> over there? Don't. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. One of the things that we run up against is it's really, really, really hard to figure out how many people are actually going to show up based on how many people voted. Um, so I've got a helpful little document here. I want you to think with me for a minute about the problem that this software is solving. What should a scheduler do? Um, one thing you should do here, if I type one handed, I don't think so. sessions to rooms at different times. What would go wrong? Uh, some of the rooms would be too big and too small. People would be angry because everything they wanted to see was at the same time. Um, presenters would end up having to do group two presentations at once. Any, anything else? So in one question, I'll touch on a previous story. Some current and might be a topic that asked you. Yeah, that, I think that's in the interrobang after human behavior there. Um, it's, it's really hard to tell what people are actually going to show up for versus what they voted for. Um, I'll throw up another one here, just, uh, and then maybe we'll call this good. Um, imagine, imagine that we put all of the most popular sessions in the first hour. <laughs> I decided I so, to build what I want to talk about today is how the algorithm works, how we actually solve this problem. Um, and there's a, a general moral of software and data modeling and problem solving in general that comes out of this. And the moral, I'm just going to give away the end, is that um, really two things. The first is good enough is good enough. And the second is sometimes uh, you can make your life a lot easier by making the problem simpler. So this is a lot to think about all of us. And uh, to help us just really appreciate the shape of the problem, um, I built up, this is this is a very, this is like alternate universe mini bar. Um, we have a few attendees, Sally, Fred, Irene, and some pretty awesome sessions. We've got one on ghosts, one on space invaders, a two-minute session, a quick-minute session, fairy session. I think Sally probably wants to see the fairy session, the wheel session, and the taco session. I think most people would like the taco session because <laughs> it's almost lunchtime. Irene is really into safety pins, puzzles, and dancing. And Irene and Prudence have that in common, right? We, we ask you to do what I'm doing on this grid with the mini bar schedule, right? And we say, yes, I might attend this session. We record all of those. Um, the title of this session is 
7,777 votes, which was actually the real number of votes that we had at the moment that I assigned the rooms. I was really excited about that. <laughs> um, that's also a record-breaking number of votes, by the way. I'm also excited about that. Uh, we ask you for those votes so that we can plan this, right? So let's imagine all of these people voting. Um, you know, Alvin here, Alvin really wants to meet the whales. He's here for the whales. But Irene, she's kind of in it for everything. Except for the, nobody wants to see the evil eye session. That's it. Roots. Roots wants to see the um, So let's try assigning these to the time slots. Right, where should we put things? I got someone to bring where my options were continuing Facebook. <laughs> well, what are, what are some sessions that should not be at the same time? If I wasn't so experienced in Apple Diet, I would not have known what to do. Ta tacos and what? Tacos and whales. Tacos and whales. Let's put them. Tacos at 3 o'clock. No, at 1. Everybody's like hungry at 1. Whales at 2 o'clock. Sound good? Okay. Which is both too healthy. Like I mentioned before, the data is also a bit blurry. They, okay, so they're, yeah, they're, they're really overlapping. Fairies and whales should definitely be at different times. It's kind of hard to see, right? So doing this for minibar, we have, it's, it looks exactly like this, except that the grid is uh, 157 columns and about uh, 600 rows. Actually, it's more like 800, I think, individual people. So it's not going to happen by hand. But with this one, it's really, really hard to pick out where all of the conflicts are. We start, if we even just like uh, try to finish up with the rainbows right here. Oh, see, it's rainbows. OK, that's good, that's good. Like, the one person who really wants to see rainbows can see rainbows, right? This works. Um, spotting conflicts in a more realistic, randomly distributed set of votes, this is going to be hard. What we need is some way of sorting this out. So here are some simplifying assumptions that we use to solve this problem. Uh, first of all, uh, one useful insight is that it's really easy to reassign sessions to different rooms within the same time slot, right? There's not a lot of interaction there. If we realize that like the mini bar session thing is, you know, it's in a room that's too big, and the junior devs should have this room, they probably should. I'm sorry, junior devs. Um, we can change rooms, and it doesn't cause cascade effects, right? But if we move this session to one o'clock, then there was somebody else who wanted to see this session, and now they can't because they also want to see something else at one, right? So we move that session. Well, that has domino effects, right? Changing time slots is a fundamentally harder problem than changing groups. Am I convincing? So here's what we do. Forget about rooms. Rooms are easy. Once we have them assigned to time slots, we just say most votes goes to the biggest room, next votes goes to the next biggest room. Really, the reason that you see so many crowded rooms and so many half-empty ones is that the distribution of group sizes at Best Buy is really ill-suited to the distribution of votes, right? We have a group that seats 250, four that seat 100, one that seats 48, one that seats 40, and the next biggest is 25. What we really need is a bunch of rooms that seat like 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30. But actually, all the rooms are kind of either too large or too small. Uh, and it was, in fact, I think three votes would have put this in a room that seats 40 instead of a room that seats 100. It, it comes out that close, right? Um, but we can kind of forget about rooms and just focus on assigning things to time slots. That's my first insight. The second insight, and this is a tricky one, the second insight I have is that instead of trying to make an algorithm that does the thing that we're doing, where it just looks at all the possible sessions and figures it out in some kind of holistic sense, it would be a lot easier to solve this if we had some way of scoring the schedules. I'd like to say, for example, um, so here's, here's all the sessions assigned to time slots. Here they are assigned to different time slots. Is this schedule better than this one? 
Okay. It probably was, just a bunch at the same time. <laughs> what about this one? Is this a better schedule? So really, the hard question here is what does better mean? And that's what I want to spend most of the session talking about. Uh, I gave a talk on the scheduler a few years ago that covers a different part of the software. Um, so I'm just going to give you a really yeah, quick synopsis of that so we can ignore it the rest of the hour. Um, we have a metric. We have a way of scoring schedules. And the way we determine the schedule is we use a technique called simulated annealing, which is a really fancy way to randomly try a bunch of stuff. There's a little more to it. Not much. Like, this is not rocket science. Um, the software randomly tries a lot of variations on the schedule. It kind of goes with the more promising ones, and it just explores looking for a schedule that scores well. And here's the key thing. We do not have the thing that does the exploring. We don't give it any information about how the scoring works. There's a total separation of concerns between exploring and evaluating. Have an explorer that just is like, how about this? How about this? How about this? How about this? And there's an evaluator that's like, eh, 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 eh. right? Those two things work independently, which means that if the explorer is good at exploring, then we can fiddle with the evaluator to change the behavior of the scheduling without having to change the whole algorithm. That is, every kind of like, you know, we don't have to use some kind of fancy recursion technique or. There's no big so, fancy, I don't know, tree of schedules with branching down to something. No, 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 no. We just, we just have a score, and the score tells the whole system how to behave. This, this kind of technique is called probabilistic optimization. Optimization means that we are trying to make something as much as possible something, as big as possible, as short as possible, as tall as possible. We are trying to find the extreme value of some function. In this case, the function is, how good is the schedule? It's a function over all possible schedules. And we're just trying to find the best schedule, or since it's probabilistic, it, it doesn't find the best one in some theoretical sense. It's just good at finding one that's probably pretty close to the best. Uh, one more word on that. How many different schedules are there? Good morning. So if you go watch that previous talk, I did we actually really quickly compute it. Um, it's a number, the, the equation has a lot of factorials in it. And if you write out the number, it takes most of the slide. Like the actual digits of the number <laughs> take most of the slide. You can have a computer searching every possible schedule since the beginning of the universe, and it wouldn't even get through like the bottom row of digits. It's just this massive number of possible schedules. So um, you know, just evaluating them all is not an option. But exploring them by chance, if you do it wisely, is surprisingly effective. So all we need to do is come up with a good way of scoring these, where the one with the highest score is the one that we want. And then we turn the optimizer loose. All we need is a good scoring system, right? Easy peasy. So what's a good, what's, and what can we do to score a schedule? Yeah, I like, okay, we minimize conflicts. That's a good one. Um, so let's just look at, here's a list of all the people who are upset because two things are at the same time. <laughs> um, we can just count how many conflicts are there. Here's the problem with that. Uh, let's say that some people, like Prudence, Prudence has only voted for well, she's only voted for one thing, so her vote doesn't really affect anything for room size, right? She can't ever have a scheduling conflict. Let's say she's voted for two things. There's only one conflict she can have in this list. If I put her two sessions at the same time, there's Prudence. If I put it at different times, Prudence basically gets one vote in how schedules are formed. Compare that to uh, Irene here, she's really gung ho. She's interested in almost everything. Look at this right here. And look what happens to Irene's list if I add just one more that she's interested in. Boom. Right? 
right? Because and anything you need, Irene is mad, she's mad that ghosts overlap space invaders, ghosts overlap teeth, ghosts overlap feet, ghosts overlap fairy. Also, space invaders overlap teeth, space invaders overlap feet, teeth overlap feet. She's mad about every one of these things. If, if Irene is interested in end sessions, then the number of possible things for her to be angry about is on the order of uh, n squared. It's n times n minus one over q. It's, it's, it's a lot. Basically, if we count, if we count it this way, we're giving Irene more votes because she voted for more sessions. She's going to have huge influence on the schedule. That seems unfair. So here's a, here's another way to look at it. Um, how many of her sessions can I even go to? Let's highlight her. How many sessions can so she attend? Yeah, she four. Okay, what about, about Prudence? Four. Four. Well, she's only interested in two, though. She can attend four, yeah. But really, like two out of two that she cares about. Um, what about Harry? Harry can see four, but oh no. If we move this one here, now Harry can only also, see three of the six sessions that he was interested in. That seems worse. So one question we could ask um, is, what percentage of the sessions that you want to see can you see? That's a pretty good question. Another idea here is influence on that. Here, Harry can see three out of the six sessions he wants to see. Look, if I just move this one to three o'clock, now he can see four of the sessions. His percentage goes up from 50% to 67%. Um, it turns out this actually works pretty well. This is how the scheduler worked for its first few years. Can you spot the problem with this one? This one here, I think, is a little still yeah, I think actually I would say it's underweighting Irene. Because when I mess with the schedule, Irene can always see four. Oh wait, there I managed to see one where she had three. Let's just let's just randomize time slots a few times. Look at Irene's number over on the right, right over here, right here. How often can she see four sessions? Once in a blue moon, she gets three. I mean, it's possible that we end up with everything that she was interested in at the same time, <laughs> right? That's ridiculous, <laughs> right? But that's not going to happen, right? Irene, at this point, has almost no effect on the final schedule because she voted for so many. The problem with counting pairs is that it grossly overpowers people who vote for a lot. The problem with this is that it grossly underpowers people who vote for a lot. Now, um, this used to be kind of okay because it used to be that the only way you could vote for a session was to go to the individual session page and click that yes I want to attend button, which meant that people didn't actually vote for very many sessions. But we improved the UI to make it so that you can check lots of sessions on that main session list page and then people would regularly vote for, I think the record this year was somebody voted for uh, 50 sessions, <laughs> which is awesome. It would be, that's actually really good information. Like that person has neatly partitioned our 157 <coughs> sessions into about a third. They said like this one third of sessions are kind of related and they should all be spread out from each other. Um, but now it's tricky. Like the, the two obvious ways of doing it don't pan out. So let me ask you a question. Uh, Here's a session. Let's, let's look at uh, think about the Irene's not interested in every single one. But let's say that almost everything she wants to see is at 4 o'clock. Almost everything. She can still see four sessions. Is this session worse for her than this one where things are a little more spread out? I think so. Why? Why is this session bad for her? She was wrong. She doesn't have all her. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you're just waiting. Yeah. 
like she might really care about two of them, but she has no way to indicate them, like those two she cares more about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's probably got some preferences in three of the four sessions of the day. She has no choice. She is seeing what's at that time. And then in that last session, she gets to pick her favorite one. Maybe she can shop around a little, but that's only one session of the day. It starts with the Irene. Um, the, the insight that we're getting at here is that a particular schedule for a particular person has a shape. So this thing on the right, I've just taken all of the green boxes there and shoved them over. And Irene's schedule shape, based on her votes, is that most sessions, there's only one she can see, and then that last session we need a bunch. So we want some kind of measurement that meaningfully, clearly says, session shapes with things sticking way out the side are kind of bad, but we need to quantify that. And I want to pause here, this is really the third thing, well, maybe this is the most important one of the whole day. Um, we want to quantify it, and I'm going to come up with an argument for why I have a good way to quantify it. Maybe a good argument a bad one, it doesn't mean that I'm right, and it doesn't mean that there were no opinions involved, because it's on Monday. Quantifiable does not mean objective. Quantifiable and objective are two different things. So, thank you, yes. <laughs> it's usually the people who do the quantifying who are the ones uh, screaming this. You know, math has this kind of shiny object quality. It just gives the things this, this veneer of, of truth. And it's really quite misleading. Um, there are lots of assumptions and opinions, and you know, people who do math decide what those assumptions and opinions are, and often we're wrong. Um, often we're wrong because we can't be complex enough to match the complexity of the world. Often we're wrong because we're human and we have, you know, we're short-sighted, we're blind to things. Um, but what we'd really like, we'd like to give, I mean, a schedule that's like, oh, can I just move some of these? Mm, what else can I just move? I'm right here, oh, that's good. We need something that's a slot G for her, that's a better one. What about like this? Ooh, that's a nice schedule for her, right? Okay, did I mess things up for anybody else? I'm just going to take a look here, not just at Irene's schedule shape. Here's Irene, right? Here's her schedule shape. Here's a little miniature version of it. Here's little miniature versions of everyone else's. Here's all the schedule shapes. This is actually a pretty good schedule for everyone, right? Let's, uh, let's just throw out some random votes here and then randomly assign things to time slots. See those little schedule shapes on the right changing? So we need, again, we need some algorithm that kind of makes them not stick out too far to the side, gets everybody's sessions spread out as much as possible. And remember, because we're using probabilistic optimization, all we need to do that is to find a way to make things that stick out score worse. If we can come up with a scoring system that does that, the optimizer takes care of the rest of us. But here's the problem. Remember, so why was this, why was this so bad for who wants to see a lot here? Yusuf, I'm just going to throw a few more views in here. You know, why is this bad for Yusuf? Because this one and this one might not be really sessions that he wanted to see that much. But we don't know. You just vote yes or no on sessions. Right? There is an obvious solution to this problem. Can anybody see it? More data. Yeah. A ranking. Yeah, we just make everybody rate the sessions that they're interested in. And what's that? Star rating. Yeah, star rating, write them, maybe you like order them in a list. I don't know, I kind of like the star rating idea. That feels pretty easy. Um, we totally don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> There's two reasons for that. They're both good, bad reasons. Um, the first good, bad reason is that the software is a hacked up mess. It's written by volunteers. Um, <laughs> It was written by Luke Crample right at the back, wrote the original sessionizer, I think in less than a week, right before one of the mini bars. <laughs> and uh, since then, a bunch of people, particularly Justin Coyne, have done a lot of work just to kind of mop up the bad features and stuff. But it's basically still Luke's code, which on the one hand, like he wrote it in a week, you know, it could do more. On the other hand, it's been running the thing for 10 years, so nice job, Luke. <laughs> uh, 
So I said there's a good, bad reason. There's, uh, I, I think as developers, uh, most of us tend to have a perfectionist streak and we really get into making things beautiful and perfect. Um, but a lot of software is knowing when good enough is good enough. Software's been running the conference for 10 years. You know, that's good enough. It could be better. And we'd love some help. And there's a session this afternoon on how you can help if you can stop that one. Uh, but, you know, finally, we're all volunteers. We have other jobs. Um, we don't have a lot of time to put into redesigning these or interface to accommodate star ratings, right? Um, the other reason that I think is a more compelling long term reason is that it's really freaking hard to get people to vote. We really have to beat the bushes. Do you remember those emails? It's like, please vote, please vote on the sessions, right? Um, it's hard. And I worry a little bit that the urge to get more data from users will actually give us less. If we make people think hard about their star ratings, they may actually just vote for fewer sessions, which is not great. There's an, here and so often, there's a direct trade-off between UX and data collection. And it's really important to have people sitting around the table who understand both sides of that trade-off. Because if all I see is this, and I want data, I'm going to be pretty mad that I don't have it. Um, if all I see is people using the system, and now we're making them give things star ratings, and it's annoying, I'm going to be pretty mad about that. It's, it's a delicate balance. So to make peace here, I have a third argument, which is that it's kind of OK that we don't ask people for uh, individual ratings on the sessions. The reason it's kind of OK is that some people vote for more sessions than others. So think about that. If you've only voted for three sessions, they're probably really important sessions to you. If you voted for 50 sessions, you've basically just said, like, this is my top 30%. Those are both useful pieces of information, right? And because people vote for a widely distributed number of sessions, actually, you know, I meant to make me a little graph, I don't have it, but it's almost a perfect little power law curve. Like number of, if we have number of sessions that people voted for and how many people voted for that number, like a lot of people vote for one or two, and much fewer for three, and much fewer for four, and much fewer for five, and way out here is like 48, 50, 52. Um, that distribution is a really good thing. We're actually getting a nice sampling of people's hidden preference ranking. You can think of it like this. Rank all 150 sessions. Go do that. Pay half an hour, right? And now I want you to give me your top three. I want you to give me your top five. I want you to give me your top 10. I want you to give me your top 20. From this, kind of adding it up and summing, I can say, like, look, if somebody showed up in the top end lists a lot, it's got to be near the top. If it didn't, it's probably in the middle or towards the bottom. Because we have so many people voting, we actually recover some of the hidden preference information that's lost from having people vote yes, no. Um, and although this is kind of just Paul making it up, um, <laughs> it's not quite Paul making it up. There is a, a voting system called approval voting. Have you heard of this? Approval voting is brilliant. By the way, quick, quick, I think, uh, instant runoff voting is, is terrible. It's like the natural gas of voting systems. <laughs> the thing that we do now called plurality voting, where you only get to vote for one candidate, is the worst voting system you can imagine. Like, all the people who study voting systems just hate it. It, has, you know, it splits elections because this happens. You worry about it. It's why we have a two-party system, because it's strategically ridiculous to run more than two parties in a plurality election because of vote splitting. Instant runoff voting is like, it's the next worst of all the systems. <laughs> There's one called approval voting. It's beautifully simple. The way it works is that you just vote yes or no on each candidate. Like, check all that you approve of. And people have actually studied this kind of question with approval voting. Some people will check most of the candidates. Some will only check one. Some will check some. And because people vote for a different number of candidates, you're capturing some of the hidden preference information. As it turns out, if you're working with a large body of votes, hundreds or thousands, your approval voting is incredibly effective at drawing out hidden preferences, even when you don't ask people to rank, because you're asking people to sample their rankings. Make sense? 
sense. So I think it's okay that we do the yes no thing, but we still need to score this dang thing, right? That was the original problem. Somewhere out there, there's a scoring system. It's like, Paul, what are you doing? You have like 15 minutes left. Uh, here is the insight that led to the better scoring system that makes the better mini bar schedules of today. We don't know what this person's ranking is, but they have one. Here, Yusuf secretly has an internal order of preference for these sessions. And Yusuf is probably going to get to see the first, third, second, and seventh items on his preference list. Or maybe he has a different ranking. Maybe he'll get to see the first, second, third, and fourth. That's an awesome schedule for him. In that case, it is not. You know, here's here's another one where he gets to see the first, second, fifth, and seventh. These are two that he almost didn't vote for at all. He's kind of bummed about this, right? We don't know. We don't know. If we can see his preferences, we can say that, well, you know, let's just say that like the, his number one choice is worth like this much to him, and number two is worth less, and number three is worth less, and just kind of assume that his preferences, um, how valuable they are to him, is kind of spread out in some kind of scale, right? And we can look at this and say, like, well, what percentage of his total joy is he able to experience? Right? Like he's number one, he's this excited, he's number seven, he's this excited, sum it up, like how joyful is this for him, right? If we knew his rankings, we could say that. So here's the insight, he has a ranking, we can't see it. So we just look at all possible rankings and ask on average how happy is he with this. Another way of saying this is, what is the expected, I'll, I'll use the word joy, what is Yusuf's expected joy for this schedule shape? And when I say expected, like if I say, uh, take out a coin and flip that coin a hundred times, how many times do you expect it will come up heads? Yeah, it's 50. Now that's not right. It's not actually going to come up 50 times, almost certainly. But it's about right. On average, it's right. Um, we call that in, in the statistical terms the expected value of a random function. Like he has some unknown random ordering of all of these sessions. What is the expected value of this schedule for him? And the way we do that is we assume that his uh, sessions have some randomly distributed range of joyfulness for him, right? And we assume that in each of the time slots, he's going to choose the one that he's most excited about. So, in the first section, it's the first session from a bucket of two items out of a random distribution. He chooses the highest value of one. What is that value? And he only gets to choose the best of one in the second. That expected value is going to be a little lower. He gets to choose the best of four in the third. So that expected value is a little higher, right? And then we sum it up across all the sessions. Um, this required some very, very, very high-powered math. <laughs> Use the heck out of that math degree. I actually just used Google. There's like there's an answer to this question straight up on, on Stack Exchange somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> Here, here's the answer. I put it I put it in equation, so it looks fancy. But even as an equation, it looks kind of like cheating. So we sum up. We take each time slot t. We say how many. How many sessions did this, this is just for one person, by the way. How many sessions did this person vote for in this time slot? Multiply that by two and divide it by their total number of votes times number of sessions in that time slot plus one. Even with the fancy notation, this is, this is like basic algebra. This, the most complicated thing that happens here is multiplication. This felt so much like cheating that I had to go back and spot check it a bunch. So here's a question for you. What if we have, what does a perfect schedule look like in this system? The ideal schedule. Yeah, which means that there's only one session they voted for in every time slot. 
So one session you voted for in every time slot means that V of T is always one, V sub T is always one. So it's two on the top and then there's two on the bottom, they cancel. And it's one over the number of votes. And then we're summing that over all the time slots, each of which has one vote. So that cancels, it's number of votes divided by number of votes, so it's just one. The perfect schedule gets a score of one. Nice, because you get 100% of your expected value. Cool, okay. Um, what if everything's in the same time slot, the worst possible schedule? So all the other time slots, it's zero on the top divided by zero plus one times something. It's zero over non-zero. So all the, all the empty time slots just get a score of zero. The one with everything in it, it's V times V plus one, and there's a V on the top. The V's cancel, so it's two over V plus one, and it looks like about one over the number of votes. You voted for n things, and you get something kind of close to one nth of that. Um, because I'm a visual person, and I love graphs, I made a picture of this for uh, several different schedule shapes. So here's that best possible schedule. You just keep adding more and more and more time slots. And no matter how many sessions, it's getting a score of one. Here's the worst possible schedule. Can you see my cursor waving down here? <laughs> this worst possible where there's one time slot that has everything you want in it. And then here's some other schedule shapes that fall in between, like uh, that green one in the middle. Half of your sessions end up in one time slot, and half of your sessions end up in their own time slot. That was the Irene situation. Remember Irene? If you take a look at that green line, it's kind of getting worse and worse and worse and worse as the number of sessions grows. But it's still not as bad as the worst one. Interestingly, it's not as bad as uh, the one where all of your sessions are evenly distributed between two time slots. That's the sort of the, the third from the bottom there. Let's take a minute to spot check this. Does it make sense? I feel like the purple one and the blue green one, the uh, third from the top and the third from the bottom. Those are super interesting ones. Notice the third from the top seems to always get a score of two thirds, no matter how many uh, how many sessions there are. You get to see about half of the sessions you wanted to, but you get to pick the best of each pair. So you're actually doing a little better than 50% of possible choice. That bottom one, you know, having them all evenly distributed between two time slots is better than having them almost all in one time slot except one, which is still better than having them all in the same time slot. So I spent some time like fooling with this and convincing myself that yeah, it seemed to work. And if you, you want to watch it happen, this is what we're all here for. Right? <laughs> um, here's some random time slots. Here's some random rules, and here are the scores. And then I'm untitling Yusuf and coming to everybody. Else. Well, let's take a moment with Yusuf. Yusuf's score is 0.62, 62% of his possible joy from the bar. Can we do better? It looks like if we move some of these sessions out of that third time slot, 0 0.65, 0 0.67, look at that. And that's about the best you can do. What if we make things really terrible for? Uh, 0.5, 0.38, uh, what else, 0.34, 0.22. Notice there's a big leap for him. Having just that one session, he goes from 0.22 to 0.34. Just, just one more session in the day means a lot to him versus having them all stuck in the, in the same time slot. Imagine these all spread out again. Here's a pretty decent one for him. Um, what does it count, like moving one more session out of the slot? Like his session, his seventh ranked one, whatever that one is, you know, it would be nice if that one moved out, but he doesn't care much about it. So let's go ahead and just move number five. It went from 0.65 to 0.67. 
So the thing that this metric is doing that we like is even if he's going to see four sessions no matter what, we're still capturing information about all the sessions that he voted for. Even though he voted for almost, but not quite all of them, that's still helping our scheduler pick a better schedule. That's totally what we wanted to do. Um, let's unhighly use it here. How's everybody else doing? It's actually a pretty good schedule, except for Sally. Sally's got one of the worst possible. Look at her. Can you, it's kind of small. Can you see her little like three dots sticking out? Um, so I've, I've done for today's talk. This is a dramatic reenactment of, <laughs> of the scheduling. The actual random search algorithm is a little different from what you're seeing, but it doesn't matter because they all look like this. And way down at the bottom, you see best score. Every time that ticks up, it's found a better schedule. This pairwise thing. It doesn't seem to be finding anything better than 0.87. Let's see what that one looks like. There's the best. Look at that. Nothing is sticking out more than three. Pretty cool. Uh, yay. So does it, does it do what it's supposed to do? Um, this one is, depending on how you look at it, either trivial or impossible. Right? The rooms are not the right sizes for the sessions. We do the best we can. If we had a way of predicting who's actually going to show up, we could do better. I've worked on that over, year, over the years, and I worked on it this year, and I still don't think we found anything better than counting raw votes. Um, future work. This, we're all about this. <laughs> How do we do this one? The answer to this is shockingly simple. Well, um, we also want to be able to kind of shuffle presenters around, right? To like, you know, go from two overlaps to one overlap to none. So the way the scheduler works, it actually does this algorithm twice. And once it's with who voted for what, and the second time the purple grid is who's presenting what. I take the who's presenting what score, and I multiply it by a big number. <laughs> so that who's presenting what always beats out over who voted for what. And then I just feed that into a single giant metric. So actually, at the same time that it's uh, looking at votes, it's also preventing preventer overlaps. And I do a kind of similar trick with presenter time constraints. So yeah, this it, it totally solves. This it totally solves, same reason. Human behavior, still working on that. I don't have to back <laughs> that to finish it out. Um, this one is worth noting. The algorithm totally does this. If a lot of people voted for a session, then that session is going to overlap with a lot of other sessions. If two sessions are both popular, they're going to have a lot of overlap, so they get spread out. Except occasionally they don't. Once in a while, we'll have like a couple of the sessions from the top four at the same time. And every time we second guess them, like, what is the schedule doing? We go in and look, and like, yeah, no, but not a lot of people voted for both of those two popular ones. You'll end up with two totally non overlapping topics, like uh, for today, uh, Why Diversity Matters and uh, the Tech.MN one are all are shockingly non overlapping. Not surprising. Um, go to the diversity room. <laughs> but yeah, human behavior, honestly, like what I want to do, you, you can tell, I want to make the algorithm better. The actual work that goes into the sessionizer is fielding questions from organizers and people have to drop sessions and like, can't we have the theater? And can I move to one o'clock even though you already made the schedule? And um, a lot of the work I've done in this project is just building a lot of really quick and dirty ad hoc reporting tools for answering these questions. Well, if we move you to one, then you know, 38 people would be upset who weren't upset before. So how, how uh, much do you really want to move? Um, here is why these two sessions are at the same time. This afternoon, there's two mini star related sessions at the same time. One of the organizers is like, oh, like, shouldn't these be 
One of them is about how to contribute to this project. The other one is, hey, come talk to the old timers and reminisce about the beginnings of MIDI Bar. They're both going to be great sessions. And as it turns out, yeah, like not the same people are interested in these. You know, I'm guessing that a lot of people who are uh, looking for a side project, more experienced, looking to do stuff, they're going to go to the one. And a lot of us who are at the first MIDI Bar and are not looking for more work to do <laughs> <laughs> are going to go to the other one. So yeah, two things that superficially seem to overlap, actually. Why did it what? Why did my talk get in there? Because it had more votes than the other. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> well, too late now. I'm late in the session, I think. And you know what the thing is? I guarantee you, the theater is going to be half empty. The theater is always half empty. It's just too uh, So there's, I mean, the last world of this is that math is awesome and tech is fun. But really, the human part is always the biggest problem. <laughs> the one that requires just finessing and goodwill to solve. Um, that's it. I know it's lunchtime, so if you want to just dash out, you should dash out. No offense, but if you want to ask me some questions, I'd love to take questions. Yeah, does this still overweight a bit the people who vote fewer? Because I'm looking at the ranking there, some people are getting 1.0, and they're the people who have, you know, one or two sessions checked. Like, they, like, and the people who have, a, like, eight checked can only max out at, like, yeah, this is this is the question that I currently do sleep over the most. Um, it's a really hard question to answer. On the one hand, yes, if you only voted for three sessions, then just a few changes cause a huge change in your score. And that does seem problematic. On the other hand, somebody who voted for a lot of sessions is affecting a lot of sessions. And uh, in my own like thinking through the problem, it's not clear to me how big the multiplier effect of that is. So um, my, my current little research project on the sessionizer is to actually try to come up with some kind of criterion for voting power that I can use to measure how much effect you have on the schedule based on how many sessions you voted for. And I honestly don't know what the right way to measure that is yet. So if you have thoughts, I'd probably lie. Clue can I have an idea that goes along with your plan. You're free to ignore, but like, you could find people who have similar votes uh -huh. to the I, I thought about synthetic voting too, um, especially for room assignment, trying to extrapolate attendance from, again, I just haven't, I haven't found a clean way to do that that's obviously better. I think that is Hello and the classes there and then Christopher here. Um, if I understand you right, we could maybe like look at the range of possible outcomes for their schedule. Is that kind of what you're saying?
You might know that I was kind of very angry emailed from somebody who was like, I can only attend seven of the sessions I voted for. And they're like, there's only seven time slots. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Actual thing, but yes. Um, but I guess I would say, you know, just looking at it, like if I if I've got somebody who's going for for three things, they really want to get to those three things. So maybe waiting on I am just curious why you know, maybe that doesn't care. Yeah. That you're in your yeah, yeah. overweight to something about various and this is, I mean, I've gone back and forth on this versus the should we scale them up. Um, I really don't know. I hesitate to mess with it because the metric we have right now sort of does mean something. There's like there's a total value you can get out of it, and we're trying to maximize that for everyone. It's hokey, but at least it's consistent. Um, if I'm going to meddle with it, I'd like to have some way of knowing. Do you have any vision of how coalescing the feedback loop would work? Because right now we're relying on people saying this is what I want. And humans are pretty bad at actually knowing what they want. Yeah. So is there like any vision for human tracking, like QR codes or anything, so people can actually uh, say I want to see this session? No. Um, but it would be awesome. <laughs> it's, you know, for a shoestring project, we've got to be uh, careful about what we're we, um, we did one here and actually have a bunch of volunteers get head counts in rooms. And what we found was that votes have a good but not great correlation of actual attendance. And none of the other systems that I could come up with did any better with the same data. I have a strong feeling that it's in there if I had the right thing to look at, maybe looking at how many they clicked. I've, uh, I've had some moderate success compensating for how many sessions there were at the time you cast the vote. So sessions that were there for a long time picked up more votes over time. But now looking at this room, I think this session got bumped up a little because it came in late. And this could, this could certainly be a recording, right? So it's not clear to me that you know, that is working. And so if I short of answer your question is um, we'd love to not really, but we have done some at least casual head counts. And I'd love to get more data closer to the time. I, I wonder if there are different parts of why people vote. I mean, there's certainly different parts of why people vote. But the, the most clear one that comes to mind for me is you've got people who vote for a session because they want to go to the session. And then you also have people who vote for a session because they're friends or co workers yeah. or former professors. Like, it's getting that session. <laughs> though, though people in that situation do sometimes show up. Also, <laughs> at the same time, you may have people who vote for it simply for that reason, yeah. uh, with no intention of showing up. Yeah. I almost wonder if you could get a slight improvement by saying, yeah. here's an opportunity to like a session and an opportunity to vote for a session. So, yeah. uh, I don't know if that's actually yeah. I, I, I really don't know. There's so many, like UX could get us better data, um, especially if it's low friction. And I would, I would love, what I'd really love to do is have several hundred mini cars a year, <laughs> but also not, because I can't have it slept enough, and really like more than once a year of this would kill me. Um, but yeah, I, what you're saying is true, and I see it particularly actually, any session that has the word diversity in the title, people vote for and don't show up for, because people love to vote for diversity and they don't love to show up for diversity. Which is kind of a metaphor for everything. <laughs> uh, I was just curious when this uh, scoring algorithm went into place versus the previous one. Like, is, this, is this one uh, newest this year or? I want to say it was three or four years ago, maybe. Um, I did notice a downtick in complaints when it showed up. Maybe it's just me. Again, to your metrics question, we're, you know, we're tracking this in a Slack channel not with actual data, but uh, 
But uh, I, I do feel like it's improved. And I want to, it was either three or four years ago. I'd have to look at the kid history. Maybe take one more question, and I know everybody wants pizza in their hearts or other delicious foods, right? Am I wrong? Um,